Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know that we're in for a real treat. I'm Robin Ewing, and with Professor Michael Anderson, I co-direct the CREATE Centre. Before we go any further, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our First Nations Australians. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd like to acknowledge that they have taken great care of this wonderful country for many, many thousands of years. Uh, and the story and the arts are at the centre of their doing, knowing, being and becoming. And I think so many Western civilizations have so much to learn from exactly that. I'd also like to acknowledge that the land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. The University of Sydney is on um, in Gadigal country, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm joining from Darug country. You might like to acknowledge in the chat where you're joining from. If you don't know a lot about the CREATE Centre, then um, I suggest that you have a look at our website and that you think about becoming a member because this kind of webinar is only part of the work that we do. We focus on creativity in research. We focus on engaging and celebrating the arts in all its, its disciplines. We particularly focus on transforming education, health, and well-being. I'm sure that Anna will put in the chat um, the link anyway. And um, yes, we'd really like you to think about joining us for this, the, for many of these kinds of occasions and telling others about what we do. Before um, we go any further, I'm, I just want to thank both Dr. Anita Collins and Dr. Amanda Nyland for the time and joining us tonight and the work that they've put into this presentation. Where would we be without music? Where would um, any human being be without understanding how wonderful music is and how it's part of our very being. Anita and Amanda are both really strong advocates for the power of music in our lives and in our learning. And I think what's been really interesting um, over the last few decades is how strong the research is coming back, perhaps to underline what we've already known innately, how important um, music is um, in so many different aspects of our lives, but also just for music to be music to celebrate. I'm not going to um, dwell on their bios, just suffice to say Anita um, is an award-winning researcher, writer and educator and it's been wonderful Anita that you've had such a high profile in sharing the importance of neuro, the neuromusical in, in our, um, our lives and helping us understand that. And Amanda, has been really um, advocating and teaching about the importance of music in particularly in early childhood education for many, many years, both as an early childhood teacher, as a primary teacher, and then as an academic, both at Macquarie Uni and um, now at Sydney Uni. Um, I think Anita is going to speak first and Amanda's going to follow. And if you have questions along the way or a comment that you'd like to make, don't hesitate to put it in the chat. Um, we're going to have plenty of time for some discussion and, and questions and conversation. Well, that's, that's our aim anyway. 
So over to you, Anita. Thank you so much, Robin, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to do the good old share your screen and we'll get started. Um, a little bit more about my background, or at least, uh, I think more about the lens that I look through all this research. I am fundamentally a music educator. I'm still a practicing music educator. I still work in schools. Um, and I have then also worked in tertiary at the University of Canberra and the ANU teaching in tertiary space as well. And I now work as an educational consultant. But my passion in the field that I'm really fascinated with is neuromusical research. So having those two sides, which is using music as a tool to understand how the brain learns and grows uh, with everything, not just with music, but also then going back the other way to understanding how music learning, um, why things work. That was one of my most fascinating things to start with. It's like if I understood what was happening in the brains of my students a little bit better, I think I could teach a little bit better. And that was my my pure goal at the start was to be a better teacher and hope that this informed me about that. What I found was so much more of a world that actually explained learning in general, um, not within the arts for sure but actually the whole scope of learning so my main work now is to help share that research in a way that educators and policy makers can use but what I um in chatting to Amanda she she had this wonderful phrase about you know if we if we were asked about you know we we all use music in our lives and it, that really was very, very inspiring to me to think Yes, we do, but it's not all the same. And part of that is the magic of music. Humans are the only species that have made this thing called music that's incredibly complex. And from an evolutionary point of view, there's a huge argument going on about did our brains make music in order to grow or did we we create this thing and then, then it affected our, our brains and our, our neurological development? Because it's been an incredibly powerful um activator of brain growth and development over the time of of our species and it's unique so there's something in it and it and it's very very unique from an evolutionary perspective so there's something in it that is helping our brains develop so the more we understand the more we can start to wrap our heads around it I think the more we'll understand the learning process and to me I think that's the part that I'm really interested in when I thought about this phrase about where do you know, in what we'd all say yes to we have music in our lives and it's part of our lives. But then I thought it's all very different and unique. The pathways are, are quite different. So the first one and the one I delve into most often is music learning. And I call it music learning, not music education. I think because I want to encompass not just music education in the school environment. It's music learning wherever it happens and whenever it happens, you know, for children, you know, in school, outside school, but also where does it happen for adults as well? And that could have been part of every, you know, a lot of people's lives and it could have been part of their process. And, and I'm still fascinated by meeting stockbrokers and CEOs and they, they know what I do and they then talk about their own music learning journey. And what I love to hear is how, they can often very clearly articulate what they learned through the music learning process that they now use in their professional lives. And then I thought, well, there's also the, the I couldn't think of a, a better term, but the music home life environment. You know, what's what are children particularly surrounded by when it comes to their, their music life at home? What are the, the influence, what is, what is that? But also then putting on top of that the cultural backgrounds and different interests. So there's that. There's that part of music as well. And then very much from the research as well as we all know, and COVID was a perfect example of this, is how music, we use music as humans for pleasure, but also for a very therapeutic way. And I, so many of the, even the wonderful things at the start of the pandemic, when we were sort of going, what's this thing that's happening overseas? We saw people in Spain and Italy who were on their um you know, their balconies singing to each other and playing to each other. And, and it was a way of connecting is sort of almost, you know, spiritually and emotionally and cognitively when we couldn't connect physically. So there's all these different ways that music is part of our lives. And often it's not just one of those, it, we delve into different parts. So that got me thinking about where music sits 
for everybody and how varied it can be. From the research that I look into, so neuromusical research, which is, as I said, using music as a tool to understand how the brain learns and grows, but also understanding how the music learning process happens and how which parts of it and which elements impact on different parts of learning. So it's the transfer across, which is really, really important. And for me, so and I totally understand it, a lot of people um, speak to hear what I have to say and it's like, yes, but what about music for its own sake? And it's really hard for me. I have to pull myself up, but also explain incredibly quickly that I am not arguing that we should have music education for every child in a meaningful and ongoing and powerful way just because of the transfer effects over unto other learning. I do strongly believe that we can have both. We can have musical development and cognitive development. And if we are able to talk through the narratives of that to sort of say that they're both just as valuable and they're both occurring at different times for different reasons, then I think we can use the research in a really, really powerful way. Another thing that I have found is that People who have no musical learning background themselves, they've never learned an instrument um, for whatever reason, or they've never had their own children go through the process of learning an instrument. They've just got no point of reference. And when we speak as music educators to them about all these powerful musical things that they can learn and how wonderful it is, we're working off the feeling of that, the sensory experience, the, the, the many, many times that we've gone through it. But someone who's never been in that situation has no point of reference. And this is why I often think that that explanation falls flat. It just, they've got no way to really understand it. They might understand it intellectually, but it doesn't move them. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not something they necessarily really remember or they would take action on. Whereas the cognitive research comes in and it can be a way of explaining that, look, they're doing this thing over here in music learning and this is how it transfers across to how they might learn planning or how they might understand number systems or how they might understand um, nonverbal social skills, all those things. And making those connections help people, and it is the majority of the population who've never had a music learning experience, to actually start to understand where music sits for every child. I think from the musical point of view, the, the many things that can be learned is the appreciation of a discipline. And what I mean by that is doing something over time with very small changes, little challenges, discomfort, successes, failures, all those different things that come into it and, and riding that wave. Now, it's very easy to sort of explain, well, kids do that in a sport, but in the lived experience of most children, they do a sport for the summer and a sport for the winter. The concept of a discipline means you go every single day or many, many times a week and, and you actually work at something. And music is exactly the same. And, and in our current educational environment, the majority of students don't get that experience. They don't get to look at something as a discipline or experience as a discipline, which means they get to go up and down and good things and bad things and frustrating days and fantastic days they don't get that experience so I think appreciating musical learning um, for the discipline that it creates it, it's the students experience and it also creates is important I think also from a musical point of view we now understand through neuromusical research that our hearing is our largest information gathering sense which we originally believed was our eyes, but we now understand is our ears and our ears never turn off. They're always on even when we're asleep. So the more we understand sound, how we process sound, how we make meaning out of sound, I think the more we can understand the learning process and music learning hones that skill to an incredibly nuanced um, level. And that's really, really important for understanding all sound in general. I think from the cognitive side, it's the, the neural stability and flexibility that it provides. Musically trained children and it, it progresses up into adulthood, there is a point where there is permanent and positive cognitive change, meaning the brain is enhanced and that enhancement continues regardless of if they keep learning music. 
So that neural stability and flexibility is a really important thing to develop as humans so we continue to evolve, so we can continue to be able to be flexible and deal with changes that we've got no roadmap for. And COVID is a perfect example. We had no roadmap for what we went through. We were just doing the best we could every single day with the information that we had. Being Having that neurostability and flexibility is very, very important to um, the things that are going to come our way. So helping that to, to be there. Also, similarly, self-regulation and, and curiosity, being interested in the new and the novel and the different and the alternate is something that music learning um, enhances within children's brains and it continues on into adulthood. And again, dealing with those things of all the things that are, are being thrown our way, even in normal life without climate change and without, you know, viruses, life throws you curveballs and dealing with being able to self-regulate and being able to deal with the changes every single day is so important for well-being and mental health and again music learning has been seen to enhance that part of the brain so it's almost like it does so many different things which it does and it's about for me explaining in different ways to different people how those things happen and how it looks what you're looking at and actually what's happening in their brains isn't this girl lovely? <laughs> I get to go around, well, I did when we were allowed to travel um, and see lots of this research going on. And my the infant labs are the places I love the most because they look like, I don't know, they look like playgroups and childhood care centres and they look fantastic. But then these kids go in and do these very, very complex um, experiments and they have these, these EEG caps on um, and you can see them all over the wall and they're like different sizes for the different, you know, how big kids' brain heads are. <laughs> so they're lovely, lovely places. But one of the things that we know through studying infants is actually about how music learning is the gift that keeps on giving. As I said, there's a point for music learning, um, which I'm happy to chat about if anyone's interested, um, where music uh, where it changes the brain in a permanent and positive way. And we've seen it in right up to the study in, you know, people in their 70s and then looking back if they played piano before the age of 10 and then examining their brain health versus someone who had not. And they, they have much younger brains, much healthier brains, much more robust, flexible. Neuroplasticity is still go, going strong. You know, all these things that give back to later on in life and as our bodies live longer that we need for our brains to live longer in a really healthy way. Um, again, also the mental health and the self-regulation, the inhibitory control, all these different things that are so important to function, functioning productively and in a healthy way as an adult through life and being able to give, know that we've given a child those capacities to then head off to whatever they're going to do, I think is very important. And I think the other part of it for me is just using our unique human um, faculties. It's it, music. We made music for whatever reason we made it. I think it's multiple reasons. It's not one single one. And we continue to use it and we continue to to pull on all the things that music does, both for our learning but also our well-being, um, and help us through life. And being able to provide children with um, that experience in a meaningful and positive and um, effective way in childhood is what drives me all the time to, to keep going with all of, you know, sharing of the research and understanding the research because it can inform our practices but also our advocacy as well. Um, that's where I was going to stop. <laughs> I was very aware that I wanted time for questions. I'm a real fan of questions. So I'm looking forward to your questions at the end. Well, thank you, Anita. I've, I've just um, invited people to make sure that they put their questions and comments in the chat. Oh, and, um, um, we, we are deliberately making time to have that, that opportunity to talk further at so if there are things that Anita said that you'd like to follow up, put them in there now so you don't forget. <laughs> Over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here tonight. It's um, 
such a great opportunity to talk about music. Um, I just was so fascinated listening to Anita's um, conversation and I've got questions after as well uh, in relation to um, neurodevelopment and music. I'm just going to share my screen now. Uh, oh, um, and then I'll get started too. And I'm going to take a different sort of um, approach to the same basic idea of how important music is and how valuable music is for children. Um, so <coughs> as Robin said, my background is um, coming from uh, being an early childhood educator into uh, research. And I've also worked a lot in um, the area of early intervention and I'm very passionate about inclusive education. And so I'm taking uh, a an approach and my research. I'm going to share tonight some examples um, and little extracts from uh, three research projects that I've done that looked very much at how music supports um, young children's individual and social identities, relationships and sense of belonging, um, both just in their family lives but also in um, early childhood settings and in an inclusive early childhood setting. Um, attended by a range of children of many different abilities. So um, I just have my own acknowledgement of country. I um, like to pay my respects as well to elders past and present. Uh, today I'm coming from you from the um, land of the Gundungurra um, people in southern highlands of New South Wales, uh, which is a particularly beautiful land. Um, and so I always like to, to share that. And I thought um, as part of that, because in early childhood, I think we are leading the way often with the way acknowledgement of country has become such a part of gathering as a group in early childhood settings. And so many early childhood settings have created with the children and with local Aboriginal uh, elders or community representatives their own acknowledgements, quite often being musical, quite often setting them to music or involving um, using um, Aboriginal um, clapsticks for keeping beat and rhythm and things like that. So this is one that has um, the use of clapsticks and the use of the animal sounds um, to um, pay respects to the traditional owners of the land every day in um, a preschool in the inner west of Sydney, where on the land of the Cadigal Wongal people. So I thought I would share that with you. <coughs> and um, I, this is one of the centres I did some research at and that I have a long relationship with. And uh, they uh, find that quite often when the children decide on their own in the musical play area that they will run a little group time they will always go and find the picture of the Aboriginal flag and they will always do the welcome before they decide to then sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or share around their um, instruments with each other and one of them will pretend to be the, the teacher and read the story and all that sort of thing so um, it's very much become part of the, the musical culture. So I am very interested in um, music and identity uh, and uh, I'm very, have been very much influenced by the work of Colin Trevathan and Stephen Malick um, who studied the musical aspects of the close interactions between infants and mothers in the early months of life and uh, developed a, a term and a concept called communicative musicality, which is about how innately musical the interactions are between adult and child, the sort of proto-conversations of that that uh, stage of life, that they are infinitely musical, that they are very reciprocal, led as much by the child as by the adult, and that in fact there's a synthesising of the pulse or beat of the of the interaction in a musical way and the vocal quality. So um, that's part of that conversation that um, Anita referred to as well as, you know, um, how does music fit with human civilization? 
And so our sense of self is very much being constructed in our childhood and it tends to be influenced by everything around us and all the relationships and contexts and music can very much be part of that. I think it is part of that, but it can also be used to support a positive um, sense of identity. And that's been how um, something that's inspired me in my work and my research. So I started by <coughs> studying um, uh, after I did my initial uh, PhD, which was very much based on the work of my own work as a music educator and a writer of songs for children. Um, but I decided to really look at this idea of how music supported identity and belonging in an um, early childhood child care setting for children aged birth to two. And the reason that I decided to do that was because um, of the way, oh sorry, children engage in um, musical interactions from infancy and the fact that singing and music have these unique qualities uh, as uh, Malik and Travashlin showed with their uh, theory of communicative musicality that really does frame and nurture relationships. Um, and so I wanted to look at that. Uh, and so that was my first project, but actually what I'm gonna share next is not my first project, this is my most recent project, uh, which was uh, working with a bigger team of researchers. And um, this was looking at uh, interviewing mothers about the singing that they did with their infants and toddlers. So we talked to mothers of um, who had a child aged less than 18 months. And I was part of a group of um, about eight different researchers from eight different parts of the world in Europe, Africa, Asia, um, New Zealand, Australia and the United States. Uh, it was led by a researcher in the United States, Professor Sheila Woodward, um, where we spoke to mothers about their, their perceptions, um, with particularly this idea of, of attachment and connection in mind. Um, and these were some of the, the key findings um, that I found from my group of um, participants that very much there, there was infant, it's examples of music, and particularly singing, being part of a transition from the child's life in the womb to life in the family. Um, of course, just what you'd expect about the calming effect of singing uh, and how the way that music happened in that child and mother's life was very much about the sort of musical and cultural and social identities um, of the families. And I just thought I'd share with you a few examples of some of the things that um, mothers said in answer to some of the questions. Um, so it wasn't uncommon that I found in my data and others uh, found in theirs that um, mothers would sing to their babies uh, while they were still in the womb. Um, and as you can see, um, this first example was a, a song from this uh, own mother's um, childhood and former life in, in Brazil. And um, the next mother spoke about singing when her child was fractious and unsettled and how effective it was, um, how it was such a game changer. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and how it was such a positive experience. <coughs> there was a lot of um, people who spoke about the different types of songs and the way they played with songs and the influence too with a younger child of um, things that had they'd done with their older children and how that made a connection between siblings in the family uh, with the new child coming into the family, how they music was part of the way the child gradually built all those connections um, in the family. And what was really powerful, and we all found it in all our different um, small studies in different parts of the world, um, in talking to the mothers about the feelings, the emotions that were part of singing and um, sharing music, but particularly singing, um, was just really strong positive emotions and real deep love and connections. And so that was um, very moving and very important, I think. And then we could also see building on the knowledge that seems more and more accepted by everyone of how innately musical humans are. As Anita said, we um, have that unique capacity for music that other um, species don't have. 
um, the way that mothers observed uh, the way their children's musical responses grew with them. So that was a fascinating study, which um, was an honour to be part of. Then um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the research that I did in an early childhood nursery setting, children aged under the age of two. And these were some of the key themes that emerged from that uh, research. That music was very powerful for connecting everybody in the setting um, as a way of communicating, especially because the children were um, often non-verbal communicators at that stage of their lives. How music gave the children this idea of togetherness, this reason to, to join with others. So it was very, very uh, important that way and how it was part of the security, feelings of security and being welcome. And one uh, story that was really fascinating that, that I studied and analysed was um, a group of uh, children aged around one and a bit over sitting around a table with their educators playing with Play-Doh and as the educator was playing along with them she was singing row, 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 row the dough into the row, row, row your boat uh, tune and um, how this became a refrain at the Play-Doh table. If an educator didn't start singing it, a child sitting at the Play-Doh table would sing it. And you could often see the children were like moving their implements or using their fingers with the dough or nodding their heads in time with the beat of the song, um, even if it was just fragments of the song, um, and that they would look at each other. Sometimes one child would sing a little bit, another child would sing a little bit. And this happened, I visited this um, setting over um, several months, a few times a week. It, it, it happened every time there were people at the Play-Doh table. It was just this amazing um, musical connecting ritual um, that not only was sort of socially connecting in a way of communicating with each other, it also showed the children developing musical skills or showing their, their innate ability to feel the beat of music. So that was a fascinating uh, example. And there was another... Um, wonderful way. The educators here were very committed to, to music and music was a constant part of the day and they sang a lot with the children. And there was a wonderful um, play I observed one morning over a few hours where um, they had a, a large box like this. Um, I couldn't find the photo that I did have from several years ago so I just used a photo off the internet just to illustrate that they had a, a box um, and they had a, a piece of see-through but dark coloured uh, curtain across the box and it was uh, on the side of the sand pit and the children were playing in and out of the um, box popping out from behind the curtain all that um, all morning and the teachers started uh, singing a song about a dark, dark house in a dark, dark room. She just improvised it with a, a familiar tune um, and the words would change depending. And the children were like waiting for um, appropriate times in the song to come out and then copying each other. And there was this whole framing of this play episode and framing of this song that, that um, and a, a huge amount of fun and communications um, that happened just because of this um, educator added this song into this game. <coughs> so the other project I wanted to um, share some um, examples from today was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was a, a project um, that I, um, again, building on um, my interest in how music supported identity um, and belonging uh, was in a preschool where a lot of children um, attend of, of very different abilities because it's a preschool that is part of an early intervention uh, centre. And I wanted to look at how music contributed to the children connecting to each other. Um, and these were some of the important um, points about identity and belonging in relation to inclusion that I feel are are really important and that were my, my rationale for doing this study, um, plus my belief and experience of the 
Um, role that music can play as a form of um, way of connecting um, people to each other. <coughs> so this was my research question. I wanted to specifically look at how music could support social connections and relationship building in this setting. And I particularly chose this setting, which is a wonderful example of inclusive education in early years and where music was very important to a few of the educators and music was a big part of, and still is a big part of every day. Um, and this is just um, what could sound to some like a dream setting uh, that isn't always how uh, early childhood settings are, but this is in fact how this particular setting is where every child is is valued um, and every child is welcomed and where there's a lot of um, adaptability, responsiveness and flexibility. And I wanted to share with you um, this particular story which the educator who shared it with me uh, called Fire Music. Uh, I did this research in um, gathered the data in 2020 and I was going to be doing a lot of visiting, observing and videoing and it ended up being that the educators um, used their educational pedagogical documentation and observations and we did interviews and I did the whole thing remotely because of um, Zoom but um, it was great because I got data that had been written and gathered by the educators themselves who knew the children very well. Um, so this is called fire music and it was um, obviously had something to do with a fire extinguisher and um, a YouTube video, uh, one of many that the children watched because they became very fascinated by this street percussionist by the name of Dario Rossi. Um, I heard you, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, look him up on YouTube, he's totally amazing. So just to share a bit of background on this young musician uh, who I'll call Lenny. He's a four-year-old who is fascinated with sound and a non-verbal communicator who had a diagnosis of autism. Um, and the educator who took these notes and worked closely with Lenny often um, very much focused on what his musical play meant to him and on him as a musician. And this is one of the things that she wrote um, in her notes about him, how what a strong interest he showed in music and how he had this really deep analytical interest in sound. Um, and she um, teaches the children some um, sol fa, the do, re, mi, fa, so, etc. names of the notes of the scale because uh, she happens to um, have that uh, in her own musical background. So she wrote this story um, on the day um, of this fire music. Um, as we were listening to Dario Rossi's performance, Lenny jumped up, ran to the fire extinguisher and began to drum on it. He tapped the beat of the drum solo, which was being performed by the musician. So he was synchronizing with the video. He looked up to the video sometimes, but otherwise relied on his listening only and was keeping the beat even at the very fast parts. And then another child, Ching, joined in, joined in and they were both playing on the fire extinguisher. Um, and Lenny looked at Ching and was smiling um, and they both got very excited. And in, th and in the end, the whole class was very excited and, and laughing. There was about, I believe, 10 or 12 children in the room at the time. And what was fascinating about this too, uh, in following this uh, story over several months, was that this was a child who um, basically didn't join in a lot with other children and hadn't really formed many connections with other children but this particular connection he made with this child Ching on this day became the beginning of regular connection and a sort of fairly non-verbal friendship between the two of us and also the feeling of value that he got from the other children's appreciation of his music meant that Lenny started joining in with them more at group times and at musical musical group gatherings in a way he'd never done before. So music really made a difference to this child. So, sorry, there's a typo there that should say findings. Um, so these were my sort of key themes that came out of this um, project. 
uh, which was that what these educators did that made music so inclusive and so powerful for um, being able to help the children to connect with each other and uh, build relationships was that they didn't think about what they thought children should learn. They focused on what the music meant to each child and they used that as their starting point. They also shared as part of their way of really valuing diversity, a huge range of different types of music. Um, so from classical music to different folk music to live music from family members to um, street percussion, um, as in the Dario Rossi videos, those sorts of things. They also very much saw every child as a musician and valued all of their contributions. This idea that um, Bicklin and Burke write about in terms of working with children with disabilities, the idea of presuming confidence as being an important part of inclusive education, presuming everybody's competence. Uh, and that's it for me. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to share those um, different snippets of research that gives examples of how um, music can be such a um, powerful contributor to um, children's identity as well as to um, more directly to their brain development as uh, Anita was talking to us about. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Amanda. Thank you both, Anita and Amanda, for such interesting and, and um, really important um, research and, and experiences and observations. Um, we have a couple of questions already, but I'm going to ask one first <laughs> because I think it's really unequivocal the, the, the research that you've been sharing, the, the um, observations that you've made in, in different contexts, etc. But sadly, we know um, that not every child has those opportunities, you know, to uh, learn an instrument, to, to sing, um, if that's not something that's happening in their home or, or in their early childhood context. Um, do, is that something that we need to find a way to address? Because we know that, that there's just such inequitable contexts, I guess, for not just children, but not just young children, but old children and, and adults as well, because we're talking about the whole continuum, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, do you want me to start? Or do you want... <laughs> um, yeah, I absolutely agree and I'm I'm very privileged to be part of a 10-year campaign to have ongoing meaningful um, sequential music education for every child in Australia and yeah. when you say it like that it seems like it's so easy what's in the way <laughs> but I think I think what from my point of view this research helps is to open up another door to a whole bunch of other research we have about why music learning is so powerful, but also it just adds another dimension to it. And I think another dimension that people understand. What's fascinating for me is the place between when they listen to, understand, engage with, accept the research, but then it doesn't lead to action in any sort of uh, childcare environment, school environment. Um, it doesn't change anything. So I'm interested in that gap. So why? Why when you've got so much research mm. that is pointing all you know in the same direction in multiple different ways, don't, doesn't it lead to action? And to me, what I think is sitting there is still some very powerful myths um, around who should learn music, why we should learn music, and um, who gets permission in a way to, to learn music. I think we still have lots of ideas around talent and around born versus learnt. Um, we have a lot of uh, myths around the idea of taking up music, any art form, I believe, but music in particular seems to have it very heavily, which is this whole idea that, well, if you're not going to be the best, you don't even start. And it's like that doesn't work for a whole bunch of other things. So why have we got this myth sitting here? So I think 
I'm fascinated fascinated by the bit in the middle and helping to use the research and different ways of talking about things to then say, okay, let me get you closer from understanding the research to actually taking action in your own context. Mm. Great. And Amanda? Um, oh, I think um, actually Anita's really, you've really hit the nail on the head there with that that middle ground, like, mm. yeah, what? How? why can't we make, the bridge yeah yeah I, I'm, I guess I, I've been reading a lot about the neoliberal agenda and the whole of uh, high stakes testing and everything's got to be measurement and productivity focused and all that just mm. um, because of a, a student of mine who's just submitted her PhD that had a lot of that in it uh, she was trying to look at how the arts mm. can um, create an alternative to that um so and and i guess it it's it's partly that plus it's a it's a cultural thing in australia because um we've had gradually like in teacher education a gradual erosion of yeah. how much music and arts but particularly music which does take time as anita as you said with the discipline that's involved in becoming a competent musically um the the erosion of that in teacher training um and then the fact that the children coming through school all the way through don't have that musical foundation because the teachers aren't there with yeah. that knowledge in the school and then with the neoliberal thing um spending time on um say school musical performances or musical events or a music festival day or something gets pushed to the side because we need to prepare for NAPLAN or or you know do that stuff plus Australia the the big emphasis on sport of course um yeah. as mm -hmm. being the big bonding bringing everyone together giving those feelings of success mm -hmm. um like all those things are all involved yeah. they're all part of it but but I think that yeah um yeah. things that are measurable seem to often be easier for people to grasp which is why the neuroscience research in music is actually so valuable because you can give like statistics you yeah. can give like really hard data that that seems to make a difference mm. yeah okay well thank you both for that um jane would you like to um ask your question <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Yes, I would. I was just interested in that that research that um, Anita that you mentioned around hearing being the most information gathering sense, which mm. I had. You know, it's interesting with the senses um, because all of the creative arts obviously are tapping into different senses, and um, yeah, I hadn't heard that before. So I'm really fascinated by that, and if you'd be able to share any research around that, but I'm also just wondering. Um, how that impacts students who have like hearing impairment with music and if if any of your research or studies have you know connected with um, how, how students with hearing impairments learn and and through vibration and, mm. and um, those kinds of things yeah yeah so I mean we've the the hearing or auditory processing it really came about and that understanding when they they did a, a beautiful study and they had I have being a mother myself I really applaud the mothers who did this but they had babies who were one day old and they put the tiniest of EEG caps on their heads and then they they got them to got mum to speak to the baby to then figure out how the baby right at birth was understanding speech they were interested about when the language development started were we born with it they were just trying to figure that one out and what they uh, what they discovered is at birth the language center is dormant it's it's silent it's not doing anything which makes complete sense because it's got no information that is the language part but their music processing network was wildly awake and was processing everything and it helped them understand that at birth and actually all the way through our lives we understand all sound as if it's music. So, mm -hmm. and I often say to parents, it's like, I know that sounds strange because you think music, we think music is that thing that comes out of the radio, but actually all sound is music. And part of what then fascinated me was this really interesting idea that as mu music teacher and as having friends as music teachers, we experience the world from an auditory perspective incredibly differently. 
Like we can be walking somewhere and we can hear the rhythm that's created between the TikTok that's coming over here and someone's, you know, high heels. It's we experience the world incredibly differently. So then it got us thinking, then, then the researchers got into this whole idea of, okay, well, what does the music processing network serve in terms of brain development right at birth? And then does it shift and when does it change? And it has different purposes at different parts of our lives. It never goes dormant. It never shuts down. It never stops changing our brain. And that, again, made this, this concept of sound, which I think is the most under yeah acknowledged part of education if that makes sense like we often do stuff especially when I go to primary schools it's all about eyes um and then almost the next thing it becomes tactile but we don't think about the sound environments that they're in so when it comes to they've done a lot of research on um, children and adults who have hearing impairment or or no hearing at all and they kind of look through and go is it congenital were they born with this and then or was it acquired deafness and then they've monitored the auditory processing network to see what happens. And what's fascinating is even if a child is born congenitally deaf, their auditory processing remains active. It gets taken over by some of the other senses, but it actually repurposes um, itself to interpret vibration. So in their brains, they interpret vibration as sound so they hear it if that makes sense they like these aren't working on the outside but this in here is working on the inside so they hear sound but in a totally different way so it's revealed all these incredible things um, to us and also understanding um, as we age what happens to our hearing but also it's been used significantly in concussion research and this is why you would have seen if and if you follow football, they now have concussion protocols. And one of the protocols to return to the field is an auditory test, because it is the thing that tells up if is that concussion is going is long lasting and, and where it's up to in its process. So I could talk forever about sound because to me it's a fascinating thing. But yeah, I hope that's that's of some help, Jane. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Sure. I just add one tiny thing um, in relation to your question, Jane, um, for anyone who's interested in that area, um, the percussionist Evelyn Glennie, who mm. is deaf, who is um, the most amazingly interesting person, um, I can just pop her name into the chat, um, she's got a website and a lot of resources and she... Um, yeah, she has this whole sort of thing of teaching the world to listen. Um, and you probably find some of her resources are interesting. There's some things that are useful from an educated point of view as well. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of hearing her speak a few years ago. There's also this awesome video on YouTube of Evelyn Glennie with Oscar the Grouch trying <laughs> to talk him into letting her join the Grouch Kateers and he doesn't want her to. Um, yeah, and she convinces him. Anyway, it's just a piece <laughs> of fun. I like to show it to students. Um, but, yeah, her name, I'll just pop it in the chat. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, it seems to me that we all have so much to learn about this. And it's very frustrating that um, all of the arts, um, as Amanda says, have been very much diminished in teacher education, both in pre-service and in ongoing professional learning because of an overemphasis, you know, on perhaps very technical understandings of literacy and numeracy. I mean, when, when I was in, in pre-service teacher education, we all had to learn a musical instrument. Um, we, could, we could sing um, if we couldn't, couldn't play a, a musical instrument, but there was much more emphasis on us having that knowledge and understanding. A lot of that, I think, because of the different changes to how teacher education um, is now constructed, there isn't time for. And yet it seems to me that we're learning more and more about how essential it is mm. our whole lives. So yeah. I find that very frustrating. Yes, I agree. And I think part of it is, if I can add to that one, what frustrates <laughs> me is in different states, I'm lucky enough to travel all around the country, but in different states, what is expected of, a, say, a, a generalist primary teacher is very different. And But the the pre-service teaching is based on almost the same sort of construction, but they're, they're being asked to do different things. And 
And I think the other thing we're not recognising is we're now within a generation of new teachers coming through who have either no experience or have what a researcher I like calls art scars. So the child who isn't allowed, you know, says, just stand there in the choir and open your mouth, but don't mm -hmm. sing. That's a scar. Yep. And <laughs> I know for me, when I did pre-service teaching, the number of teachers that would come in and say, you're not going to make me sing, are you? It's, we're going to be singing in five minutes time. And the just fear and dread that sat on their faces was incredible so I think we there's a big shift that needs to happen and it will take a long as an extended period of time yeah I think that's right I th I think that quite a few teachers carry baggage mm. um that kind of past experience in music or drama or dance yep. um yeah and and yes we do have a lot of work to do I think um now we have a, a question here, a comment and comment from. Now I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. It, N Muranti. Would you like to talk about your comment? Yes. Hi. Hi, Robin. Everyone. Hi. Um, it's Vera Muranti. I'm from MTC Australia, and um, you know I work in the adult education context and it's very fascinating you know listening to um, Anita and Amanda talk about music and, and the connection um, between those in and in the context of learning literacy and numeracy that sort of thing so yeah my question is um, um, is there can you give me suggestions or ways in which I can implement you know use music in the classroom in the adult learning context for example uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I, I actually, it's very fascinating because I tried it myself with my lowest level class and they, their eyes opened, you know, just the door ran me um, and just try to sound like um, Maria in From Sound of Music, <laughs> try to motivate them. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, I'm just reaching out to see if you can give me, you know, one or two ideas about how I can use music in the classroom. Yeah, I know for me, I do... Um, for adult learning yes um i do doesn't matter who they are i've done this with ceos i've done this with policy makers i've done this with teachers mm. doesn't matter is lots of uh, so beat keeping activities mm. and just those sort of things where you go right we're all going to keep a beat and now you're going to do this rhythm and you're going to do this rhythm and now we're going to make it more complex and now we're going to do this now we're going to do that and the reason why it's so powerful is a it's easy and you don't need anything but I the, the research I know behind it, which is as soon as we start clapping together and moving mm. together, mm. our heart beats sure. align mm. and our body temperatures align. And so if in creating social cohesion in a group, it's the quickest and easiest way to do it. So I very regularly do any sort of fun beat keeping stuff. And I just honestly, it's no plan. I make it up as I go yep. and yep. see how they respond. But the joy on their yeah. faces. Yeah, is absolutely. Amanda? Drum circle. Um, yeah. In a way, it's similar to the drum circle type mm. of um, idea. Yeah. But it does it does bring you, I mean, singing does that too, but but mm. it's, I think it's that synchronization yeah. um, that it does have that bring you together. Yeah. It's interesting because um, in terms of not talking about adults, but um, talking about children, there's a lot of um, articles around in journals and, and, teaching resources about how um, music can help language and literacy um, but the studies that are done like studying a group of children in a classroom with an intervention they're such small and convenient sort of samples they're not that they can't actually really prove anything but at the same time that's where the neuroscience research is much more valuable um, because it looks at well in this center of the brain this happens um, in relation to musical experiences um, but um, and so but the thing is that the and it also goes to what Anita was talking about before and this would relate to language and and literacy is the fact that if everything is sound then if everything all sound is music then language is music in mm. the sense that sure. yeah, it has um, beat, it has meter, it has rhythm, um, yeah. and it has pitch variations, which of course vary depending on what the language is. You think of tonal Asian languages compared to English, for example. So 
building people's sensitivity to sound mm. um, through musical activities can help um, with um, people with difficulties with literacy, mm. learning with specific learning difficulties. Mm. Yeah, because of the similarity, the musical nature of, of speech and language, basically. Mm. <coughs> um, thank you, Anita, for putting that um, website into the chat too. Um, yes, thank you. You know, thank you for your both of you for your generosity in in sharing, you know, um, giving us access to so that we can can look at this in more detail. Now, we're running a, we're running close to the end. I'm just wondering if anyone has a burning question they'd like to ask. I did have another question, but I don't want to steal the airtime if someone else has one. No, um, I just I, Amanda. I think it was in your um, presentation that you made the point. Um, imagine an early years setting where high quality musical instruments are freely available, and I'm just wondering. Um, you know, obviously, that's our dream to be able to provide you know early childhood centres and schools with high quality resources and. And you know what impact that has for their education, or or can, you know, can they have a, um, you know, an education, a a well-rounded musical education that's based in singing and simple percussion instruments, and um, you know what sort of impact does that have uh, in the long term if 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 they don't have access to those high quality instruments? I don't know. I um. I mean, it, it's it's just like that inequity thing that, that mm. Robin's talked about before. But um, I guess really just the teachers do an awful lot um, with very little in some educational settings. And if the quality of the teaching and the, the singing and the musical um, possibilities, that's possibly more important. But then at a certain point... In terms of music, in terms of anything, without decent tools and equipment, you know, you can't make the same sound. It's like you can only play on a cheap Korean factory made or could be from anywhere, sorry, I don't mean to single out violin for so long before you can't make the same music without a good violin. So, you know, I guess there's, there's a definitely an equity issue there. But there's an awful lot you can do um, with singing and mm. body percussion is amazing. The whole off mm. thing of body percussion and um, found mm. objects and all those sorts of things too. Anita, you've probably got lots of thoughts on that one. Yeah, I mean the whole concept that every everything is a musical instrument. Mm. And that, <laughs> like I think is um, it inspires the kids just as much as it actually inspires the teachers to go oh, it's not this rarefied thing that has to be perfect. It's actually about me exploring sound and using the musical concepts there. So, um, yeah, I do a lot of work in different places where we use, there's lots of chairs as drums and all those sorts of things going on. So I think it's more about the, the making of music on anything and then helping, you know, to to get those, those you know, the good equipment, the high, the high quality equipment that makes good sounds because that's actually really important to hear good sounds, um, not just any sounds. Yes, please. Um, I think, oh, that's such a big thing. <laughs> There's so many elements to it. I think part of it is going, okay, well, if the band is only for some children and only specifically selected children, then trying to get music into the, the other, you know, what else, what other music is going on. But also then I also, I love getting into the mind of the school leader and going, what's important to that school leader? Is it about student wellbeing? Is it about NAPLAN? Is it about parent engagement? You know, all those sorts of things. And the wonderful thing about music learning is you can pivot to any of those mm. to say how they're beneficial. So helping a principal see how this band actually meets their larger strategic goals, all the things that they are most passionate about, suddenly elevates that concert band program much higher. 
And I think that's a way of helping a school leader who just probably doesn't know what they've got in front of them and how valuable it is and finding ways to help them understand how valuable it is and then going, okay, well, can we have two bands? Can we have a beginner band and can we have an extended band? You know, um, what's happening in K to two with, with um, you know, music every single day, a little bit of singing, a little bit of beat keeping. What can we do there? So slowly transforming into a musical school. Well, I think, um, Anita and Amanda, it's been wonderful to hear. Um, I, th I think I kind of feel that we're just scratching the surface and we could listen to you guys all night. You've got so much um, wisdom, so much research to back up your um, understandings and experiences. So thank you both so much. Um, Anna has put in the chat... Um, uh, that the, the video will be posted on the Create YouTube channel so that you can share this with others and you can find um, um, Bigger Better Brains, the, the website, and, and, you know, sort of use this as a jumping off point, I guess, to share um, the importance of music um, with everyone that you meet, everyone you come across, because I think... Even though I think the research is starting to help us be, be much more aware of the importance of, of sound, of music, um, I, I think there's a long way to go. And I agree with you, Anita, it, it is going to take time. But we can do what we can in our little corner and, um, and we should be doing that. So thank you both so much. Um, and Anna, thank you for putting this all together again, um, making it happen. And thank you all for joining us tonight.